Why I Never Talk About Courtroom 402 Written by Polonium Poisoning I'm a bailiff, been one my whole life. I've seen everything, from neighbors fighting over some fence that shouldn't be there, to vicious murderers finally breaking down to one of our prosecutors. In between, all sorts of divorces, debts, and shameless scammers. Daphne Salisbury was the pride and joy of our district, the ace in the sleeve whenever a suspect was too twisted for a normal mind to understand. She built her cases like a cobweb, calm and deliberate. One of those brilliant minds prone to having hunches and a gut feeling that was always right, always backed up by logic later. I thought I'd never see the day Mrs. Salisbury would fall prone and powerless, like a puppet with the strings cut. We called this suspect the Suggestion Master. She was a circus girl, no older than 25. No one was able to find her real name or documents but her stage name was Marana. Marana had started off as a contortionist, then claimed that one day a magician she never saw before entered the tent and taught her some amazing new powers. She wasn't much of a stage magician, since her tricks weren't showy, like making a rabbit appear out of nowhere or something. She mostly stayed in a tent, and people paid to talk to her and see her incredible telepathic powers. Ten people were found dead minutes after talking to her. Marana had been trialed for murder, but the police had to drop the accusations after the forensics established that some of the wounds couldn't have been inflicted by someone else. In other words, most of the victims were proved to actually have taken their own lives. Hey, old Rogers, Daphne greeted me. I hadn't been on the first trial, but it was all the bailiffs could talk about. I found a way around on that Marana woman's case. I have a feeling I can't let her go today. I wish she had for once dismissed her intuition. The Suggestion Master was trialed for encouraging the suicide of 12 people. Between her trials, two more people had been found dead right after talking to her. Her defense attorney had quit for the second trial, so a new one was assigned. I kept an eye on the waiting room while they talked. No, he talked to her. It was the first time that I took a good look at the Suggestion Master, and I was... disappointed. She was the most average young woman. Brown eyes, brown hair, a boring haircut. Nothing about her was pretty or ugly, just unremarkable. But not even unremarkable enough to create a strong impression about how plain she was. I'm building your defense around the fact that you didn't know these people, and you had no reason to kill them," the attorney told her, nervously. I had seen this chap once or twice before, but never been on the same courtroom as him. He was clearly a rookie who didn't actually believe their client, but wanted to win. She didn't even blink. Her whole body language said, I don't care. At first, I thought that, after being trialed for murder, the second accusation was a breeze. But there was something off about this woman. I shifted my gaze for less than a second, and she had disappeared from the beaten-up leather couch. Good morning, Charleston Rogers. It was her, already behind me. My heart raced like it would tear off my chest and run away forever. How she knew my name was a mystery to me. People at work called me Rogers, or simply Charlie. How could this strange woman know that Charlie stood for Charleston, and not Charles? She entered courtroom 402, her anxious lawyer trailing behind. 
I obediently waited by the door for the prosecutor and the judge, but my gut, something very primal and incomprehensible, told me to leave, escape, go live in another country. I tried to dismiss myself, thinking I was getting too old and frail for this. That's my biggest regret. Daphne Salisbury started the trial as usual, quickly summarizing the case for the judge. Morana's lawyer was brief on his opening statement, simply saying that he would prove that his client had no connection to these people or reason to want them dead. The defense attorney did a decent job discoursing about how it was impossible for a mentally stable person be talked into taking her own life after talking to someone for merely 10 minutes, especially a magician. Or are you suggesting that she used some kind of trick to make strangers die? He taunted Salisbury. You know what, Mr. Barnes? That's exactly what I think. Defendant, why don't you show us the last performance that your clients ever see? Are you sure? Marana asked. She used a neutral tone, but it felt like a menace. She was. The defendant's whole demeanor changed. Her eyes sparkled so intensely I avoided staring into them, afraid I would go blind. I knew what it was. I saw this on this very courtroom dozens of times before, but never this strong. Devilishness. Well, Judge, why don't you talk about your little neighbor, Dana Johnson? The judge was a very composed man in his 60s. I've worked on the same courtroom as him for the last 25 years, and I rarely saw him distressed. And I sure as hell never saw him trembling or looking like all the blood was drained from his body before that day. It was an accident, I swear he replied. You know it wasn't, Marana smiled. The judge broke down crying. Remember the summer of 56? You boys wanted to prank the little Dana and ended up burying her alive. Marana started to approach him and I immediately interfered, blocking her way but the judge gestured to her. She whispered something in his ear, and he nodded. Prosecutor Salisbury, he called between sobs. Yes, sir? Please, don't judge me. And we watched powerlessly as the judge used the gavel to smash his own cranium. As the judge's already lifeless body fell to the linoleum floor with a heavy thump, there was panic and fear. Daphne immediately screamed his name, then told me to lock the double oak doors as she checked on the corpse. His disfigured head could be seen from the left side of the tribune, with a stream of blood coursing from it, and what was left of his eyes still open. Barnes, the defense attorney, was having a silent panic attack. As soon as I locked the door, my knees faltered, and I laid on the floor for two or three minutes, trying to rationalize what just happened. Why would anyone want to do that? God, why? Barnes was muttering to himself. Because I can, Marana said out loud. For a while, no one spoke. Then Daphne asked with all the calmness she could muster, Why did you do that? No, what have you done? I'm bored, Morana replied, and merely shrugged in response to the second question. Her utter coldness and disrespect for the human life made her lawyer start screaming, banging his fists on the doors. Please, let me out, please. I don't want to defend this monster. I don't want to be here. With tearful eyes, he kept begging, 
promising he wouldn't talk about anything he saw unless the prosecutor wanted him to. I've known Daphne since she was fresh out of college, and I knew that she didn't want to lock the door only to keep Marana from escaping. She knew the Suggestion Master was guilty. She saw it with her own eyes, but she had to understand why and how. It didn't matter that it would break her mind further. You can go, Barnes. Charlie, escort him outside. I'll talk with the perpetrator alone. I unlocked the door. I'm letting him go, but I'm staying with you. Go ahead and try your little tricks with me, murderer, Daphne defied. You won't find anything wrong on my past. I taught myself to be righteous my whole life. I was born for this moment. I was born to destroy you. Marana smiled that devilish smile again. You're right, prosecutor. You haven't done anything wrong. But aren't you guilty by inaction? Daphne stared at her, puzzled. I'm sure you noticed your high school boyfriend sneaking out of your room even when your parents weren't home. And I'm sure you connected the dots and realized why your younger sister was always crying the morning after. Are you accusing me of... What are you accusing yourself of, prosecutor? I merely made a statement about a long-forgotten memory. Whether you were connected to a horrible crime against your baby sister for two years straight or not is up to you. No, 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 no. Daphne, don't let it get to you. You were too young to know. I grabbed her shoulders and shook her, trying to keep her grasp on reality. She was slipping. She was slipping to a dark place inside her mind. I know none of this is real, but still, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't ever be myself again. Charlie, I can't, I can't. Daff, talk to me, okay? Let's sort things out. I'm here with you. Let's talk to your sister. We went no contact a long time ago, honey. It's over for me. It's over. I'm glad that at least I could understand. Yes, I finally know what she does to people. She can manipulate memories. I caught a glimpse of sanity on Daphne's face before she spiraled again. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Daphne, talk to me. We need you. What will we do with her? Will we let her do it to others? I was desperate now. Marana sat there patiently, entertained by our despair. I don't know, I don't know. I swear, I don't know. Once she enters your mind, it's over. I just know she has to be forgotten. I'm sorry, Charlie. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't let her be our personal Jack the Ripper. Tell everyone it's my fault. It is my fault. I'm sorry. And with that, Daphne punched my solar plexus, immobilizing me. She then grabbed the gun from my holster. I was still conscious, but lying on the floor and unable to use my body. Go ahead, shoot me, Morana taunted her. I know better than that. It just won't work, will it? You're the devil. And Daphne shot her own head. A few seconds after that, Morana casually said, See you later, Charlie and left. I heard her nimble steps in the distance until they disappeared. I don't know if I blacked out or if I simply fell asleep due to the emotional exhaustion. I manipulated all the evidence. It breaks my heart to say this, 
But to fulfill Daphne's final wish, I made her to be the bad guy. The perfect prosecutor, pride and joy of our district, tragically freaked out and murdered a judge she's worked with for 14 years. The defense attorney, Barnes, kept his promise of not telling anyone. He went home and overdosed on that very same night. I didn't go to Daphne's funeral or the judge's. I couldn't stand all the questioning, all the pity, all the attention I'd get from the vultures that feed on speculating other people's disgrace. But I visited her grave monthly, always patiently repainting it after it had been vandalized and leaving her daisies. The courtroom 402 was sealed and became both an urban legend and a monument to the model prosecutor who went mad and the judge she victimized. I sealed it myself after removing the bodies and cleaning up the place. I didn't want more people to see it. It was like a theater of war. Even the cops couldn't handle it, let alone the janitors. I retired and started drinking. I went to therapy too, but I couldn't tell what I actually saw so I made no progress. My wife and adult son distanced themselves from me at first, mad at my silent presence with perpetual whiskey breath and disoriented eyes, then completely left. I moved to another town where no one knew me. My mental health seemed to improve a little after that, but I still have the night terrors. I constantly dream that I'm back in court on that fateful day. I know what's going to happen, and I see everything, but I can never avoid it. It's like a crueler and darker version of that common nightmare about going back to school as an adult. And I'm still almost always drunk. I don't know how I didn't go completely insane. I never considered taking my own life, because I felt like I owed Daphne to stay strong enough to live. But I prayed every day that soon I would wake up with my judgment so clouded that I'd have no choice but to institutionalize myself. I prayed my mind would be blissfully soothed by the medical drugs. I never heard of the Suggestion Master again. I kept wondering why she didn't try to make me commit suicide that day. Maybe the condition for her macabre power didn't present itself. Maybe she wanted a surviving witness to her horrors. For ten years, I promised Daphne and myself that I'd let Marana be forgotten. That I would never talk about courtroom 402 for as long as I lived. Then today, after ten years, I felt an unrestrainable urge to share this story with the world. That's how I know. She finally came back for me. Thanks again to Polonium Poisoning for letting me read her chilling story. If you like my narrations, please give me a comment and a like. Have a good night everyone. Love, The Mistress.